Researching Practice, Introducing the Theory of Practice Architectures podcast. My name is Maureen Glenn, and I am here today with the originator of the Theory of Practice Architectures, Stephen Chemis. This is episode five, which is entitled The Theory of Practice Architectures, Understanding Practices in Order to Transform Them. So, Stephen, maybe before we get started, you might have a little think about, you know, why do we need to transform practices? You know, are many practices not OK just as they are? Yes, they are. Uh, and. Uh, but it's surprising also that m m many practices have what I would call untoward consequences. They they are. They turn out to be unreasonable or irrational. Sometimes they're unproductive or wasteful or unsustainable. And sometimes they're unjust or inhumane or uh, undemocratic. And so when we reflect on the way practices are going, we often want to think maybe we should do them differently. And so the question is how to do them differently. And that's really a big focus for today and the next session. And, 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 and the question is how to go about changing practices. Uh, and as we'll discover more about changing the practice architectures that hold them in place as they are now. Okay, great. Well, thank you. That sets us in place for today's session, I think. And so whenever you're ready, you can get started. Thank you. <clears throat> Studying practices in order to change them. Last time we were talking about practices and practice architectures and what holds them together and this relationship. And I thought I should say a little bit more about that because why would I be talking about sayings and doings and relatings? And cultural discursive, material, economic, and social political arrangements. And it turns out these, these kinds of ways of thinking about semantic space, physical space, time, and social space have been with us for a very, very long time, nearly two and a half millennia from the time of, of the ancient Greeks. Pierre Audot, the French philosopher of ancient Hellenic and, Roma, and Roman philosophy, says the aim of ancient Greek philosophy was to teach young men how to think and speak well, how to act well in the physical world, therefore physics, think and speak well was dialectics or logic, and how to relate well to others, ethics. So they studied those three subjects. They've survived in a, in a way all the way through into the medieval university and some in some ways beyond. But those pick out sayings, doings and relatings. And in the 1950s, those psychologists led by Benjamin Bloom thought we needed to talk about the cognitive, the psychomotor and the affective. Sayings, doings and relatings. The same, the same kind of dimensions, it seems to me. Jürgen Habermas's theory um, of system and life world and so on talks about the social media of language, work and power. He's pointing towards the cultural discursive, material economic and social political ways that practices are framed. And Pierre Bourdieu talks about different kinds of capital and different kinds of fields, cultural and symbolic capital, economic capital, and social capital. So talking about these strange sounding things, sayings, doings, and relatings, and these different kinds of arrangements actually connects with a very long tradition in social theory and philosophy. 
Now, I don't know, it, it strikes me as a kind of powerful way of seeing things. How about you? Yeah, um, I hadn't made those connections until just now this moment. Um, so I, I think that's really interesting. Um, so are you saying then that every practice, no matter how small or how important or unimportant it is, is connected just very simply by the sayings, doings and relatings, and of course, the practice architectures within which they're embedded. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, in life, the sayings, doing and relatings never appear by themselves. They always appear together. And the cultural discursive arrangements and material economic arrangements and social political arrangements appear together in a site. They're, they're uh, different aspects of what we find in a site. And last time we talked about uh, the cultural discursive arrangements. What do you hear? What, do you, what are they saying? Material economic arrangements. What do you see? What are they doing? Social political arrangements. How does it feel? What do you what, what do you think? Um, how do you think they're relating? And mm. so, I think these are very much part of everyday life. But when we come to understand how to change practices, it helps to be able to pick them apart analytically and to tease them apart and to find how to change one in relation to the other. Will I press on? Just one more question before you press on. That picking apart that you've just spoken about. Do you think that lies at the heart of maybe all forms of, of research, of questioning even? Um, yes, and, and, and of course, different, different as, as we said in uh, episode three, different, different traditions in the study of practice have, have understood practice in different ways and have therefore studied it using different kinds of methods, from experimental and correlational methods to you know, discourse analysis and history and so on. Different different ways of studying. But what what uh, what was in my mind when I was trying to put together this theory was how, how to have an analytic framework that allowed me to describe practices, to analyze them, what were they made of, how what held them in place, what kinds of um arrangements held them in place to form the practice architectures that held them in place? And how did they change in relation to one another, the practices and the practice architectures? And that's, those are some of the things that we'll be talking about. But for me, this, uh, what I will describe as a table of invention, as a way of looking through this framework at, the every, at everyday life or at practice in some setting, whether it's a doctor's surgery or a, or a classroom, you can see different aspects of it when you look through these different um, um, parts of the of the um, of the framework. So I'll come back to that and explore that a bit more. Okay, that's great, Stephen. Thank you. So, to say it yet again, in intersubjective space. We encounter one another as interlocutors. We're talking together in semantic space. We're communicating and we're using language to do it. We're encountering one another as embodied persons in physical space time, even via this curious uh, um, mediator with the screen and so on, in activity and work and in material. Uh, space in material and in materiality and temporality and we're encountering one another as a social in social space in these social interactions in the medium of solidarity friendship love care belonging and power power over and so on so i try to put this in the foreground to, to remind us that we're meeting one another in this communal space that's a space between us, the sorts of things we talked about in episode two with definitions of practice. So here are the practices 
interactionally secured. This is what keeps us going in the practice, reproducing the practice. And when we learn, varying and transforming the practice. And those things are seen in our sayings, thinking, the cognitive, our doings, the psychomotor, our skills and capabilities, and our relatings, the affective. In the kind of relationships we, we form uh, and uh, in the kind of emotions and feelings and moods and desires that uh, go with those relatings. And all of those things, our sayings, doings and relatings are bundled together in the project or purpose of our practice, in the agency of the people who are doing it, in their dispositions that, that um, Pierre Bourdieu called habitus, and in their situated knowledge, knowing how to go on, how to do things, say things, uh, and relate to others in this practice. So that's the side of practices, the practice and the practitioner. On the other side, we have the site or the niche for practice. And practice architectures are composed of the conditions uh, that enable and constrain action and interaction in a practice. And these are cultural discursive arrangements, the language and specialist discourses and ideas we use, all within our horizons of understanding the world. The material economics present in the site, the material economic arrangements present in the site, objects, setups, spatial and temporal arrangements found in or brought to the site, including things like raw materials, resources, facilities, our bodies, our embodied being, uh, all of these are the material things that are uh, among the material economic arrangements found in the site. And then there are social political arrangements, life world relations through which we recognize one another as human beings uh, and system roles. Uh, framed by roles, goals, rules, functions of economic and administrative systems in the site, and along with the norms and conventions that cause us to behave appropriately in the site, effectively attuning the practice. Now I'm at a funeral, now I'm at a comedy performance, uh, different ways of, of uh, different forms of affectivity are appropriate in those different places. Those things are bundled together in, 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 in practice landscapes, the places where practices happen. So if we're teaching in a school, there's a practice landscape for the practices of teaching that includes practices of professional development, leading, changing the light globes um, and cleaning the classroom. So the practice landscape contains a number of practices like different species inhabiting it and practice traditions. So that's the way we do things around here, passed on uh, through history. And so we learn how to reproduce our practices. So in a way we're reproducing the practices, the practice traditions of the practice. Now this table is the table that we use for quite a lot of our research as what we call a table of invention. We're looking at, we're looking at a person in the site and saying, what's she saying? What's she doing? How's she relating to others? What does she say she's doing about uh, in, what's her project? What kind of language is necessary for her to do that? What kind of material economic arrangements are necessary for her to be able to do that? What social political arrangements enable and constrain how she acts in the site? And so we're trying to connect up these practices with the situational conditions that make them possible. I just have one question there. Um, so 
just the example you were giving there about using your table of invention, which is which is a great idea. Um, it's not only though from an external point of view or an external perspective that it can be used. People who are, say, researching their own practice can absolutely use it as well. Am I absolutely? Because I was listening carefully in previous episodes, so I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, a friend of a, a friend of uh, mine, Andy Salomon, is a, studies early childhood um, educators, and in her uh, in her PhD study, she had a, a simplified version of this table. Sayings, doings, and relatings, cultural, gersome, material, economic, social, political ar arrangements. And at the end of the day, the when, end of the working day, she sat with the educators in an early childhood center and they talked about things that had happened that day in terms of what was said, what was done, how did people relate, what cultural, discursive, material, economic, social, political arrangements in the site caused those things to happen. And in particular, how did the educator become a practice architecture for the way the infants behaved? And how did the way the infants behave become a practice architecture for what the educators did? And she found really interesting things like, well, not only she, but others. Mandy Cook studying risk-taking in early childhood education. Early childhood educators who are risk-averse convey caution to infants and prevent them from uh, exploring the cultural and economic, material, economic, social, political arrangements to the same extent. Ones that are not risk averse will give the kids more freedom to act and to find their own way. Climb that tree, don't climb that tree. Um, they are actually transmitting ways of, re I, I mean, I, I've, I've told often the story about my granddaughter Lillian. She was coming one Friday morning and to stay the day to be looked after and she was walking along a log lying in the back garden and I shouted to her, be careful, Lily. And her father said, go on, Lily, you can do it. <laughs> and I said, why didn't I say that? <laughs> I was being the risk averse educator and he was being the take a risk educator. And I wished I'd been him. <laughs> anyway, this is a way of framing uh, how we understand what we're doing and the and the practicality of it, I think, was shown by Andy Salomon and her her colleagues sitting on the floor, thinking about their own practices, day by day after a, a day of filming and watching kids do things to make analyses of their own of their own practices and what held them in place. And just a reminder, as from before. Here's a practice, online pedagogical praxis, which is prefigured by all sorts of practice architectures. Practice architectures are not unitary, single, simple. There are many of them. And, and sometimes when we're talking about them, we're summarizing across a whole lot of these things, what are the most important things that are holding a practice in place. But when you look at it in detail, these are the things that Kathleen Mann in her PhD study, identified in interviews with uh, university teachers talking about their online pedagogical praxis. They referred to all of these kinds of things that enabled and constrained what they could do. Now, just to remind us, so here's the picture, practices and practice architectures. And here's the imperfectly previously remembered quote from Karl Marx and the 18th Prime Mayor of Louis Napoleon of Bonaparte. People make their own history, but they do not make it just as they please. 
They do not make it under circumstances chosen by themselves, but under circumstances directly encountered, given and transmitted from the past. The tradition of all the dead generations weighs like a nightmare on the brains of the living. We never go anywhere and start absolutely anew. There are always already things in place. My late wife, Rosie, had a T-shirt that she used to wear with great pride. How come they made the rules before I got here? <laughs> it's, 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 very, it's very true. But when we're thinking about practices, we're thinking about history-making action. And when we're thinking about practice architectures, we're talking about the circumstances we encounter given and transmitted from the past. And those circumstances are the conditions under which, is, under which practices happen. And they shape the way practices unfold in this site, on this occasion. So when Marx wrote those words in 1852, he was summoning this idea uh, that people need to also change the circumstances and that that's something that they can do uh, sometimes through their practices. So we'll come back to that idea. But the point, the point is, this is, a, this is a way of understanding ourselves as both enabled and constrained by the circumstances and resources and so on amongst and amidst which we practice. Okay, Maureen. Yes, I just have one little quick question here. So sometimes our conditions don't enable us to do the things we want to do well. So how would you suggest we or can we use our theory of practice architectures to address that or to understand it better? Yes, indeed. Um, uh, enablement sounds like a good thing. And and, and constraint it sounds like a bad thing. But constraint can also be keeping it on track, you know, persevering, knowing what we're doing. So we, 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 we keep on going sort of thing. Um, and enablement can also be enabling us to do things that are not productive. The situation enables us to have an accident you know, the lack of the guardrail enables us to have an accident. So enablement and constraint are uh, both positive and negative. But what we want to find out is, is how, is there a reason why we can't do things differently because of the way we're doing it now? Uh, for example, I was thinking once upon a time about, about, um, about, um, ideas about ability that had come to me in my psychology classes. And I began to think how those ideas about ability, especially ideas that it's maybe there is great part of ability that's or intelligence that's fixed and not fluid, but that enables when you think about things that way, that enables processes of streaming in schools and it, and it enables the differentiation of, of, of students in ways that might not be appropriate, although they were once thought to be highly appropriate. And so these kind, this, this way of thinking, these ideas had imposed a constraint even before I knew really that you could think about it differently and you could think differently about difference to say it's a good thing it's a great thing and let's revel in it and let's let's use it in education as opposed to uh think it's a a um an assignment to a kind of fate that you're going to have forever sort of thing so that's just one example of our thinking um, the funding of schools is another one. 
how are they funded? How much funding is there for public schools versus um, well, what we call public schools as opposed to or state schools as opposed to private privately funded schools and and the ways that that um, we currently divide people up by race and gender and and so on all of these things have impacts and we want to be able to analyze how they're enabling and constraining and these are examples that I've been using of untoward consequences I didn't realize that that way of teaching me that that, that this those ideas that I was taught about ability and how much it was fixed was limiting my capacity to respond educationally to others. Yeah, great example of the tradition of all the dead generations weighs like a nightmare on the brain of the living. <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> okay, that's great. All right, will we press on a bit? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Oh, here's an example horror. This is an example of. Um, the practice of, of mentoring as uh, supporting a new colleague, and it comes from an, it comes from a, a study I did with or with some friends, including Hanno Haken and others. And we were looking at three different kinds of mentoring. Mentoring as a supervision in a particular case, mentoring as support and mentoring as building peer group collaboration. And this is the example from Sweden of the traditional view of mentoring as mentoring as support. What people talk about in mentoring as support is helping the mentees, the novice teachers, to develop their practice. And they have a particular understanding of what mentoring is. But they're trying to talk to them and think, help them to think about what their practice is and become more articulate about their practice. On the, cult, on the practice architectures side, the, cult, the cultural discursive arrangement, there is a shared discourse of mentoring. This is what we're going to do in this setting. But there's a policy from the Swedish government from um, a 19, in the 1990s about that mandates that new novice teachers will get informal mentoring, it's called informal mentoring. Then there are things they do. The mentee collects evidence about their practice. The mentors go and observe them in practice. They may talk about observations, concerns, issues, ideas. And they meet in staff rooms, classrooms, and at agreed times and places or offices. So these material economic arrangements. In, in the case of the Finnish example, the, the peer group mentoring example, the teachers never meet in the school. They go to a cafe and they sit around a table in a cafe in order to suspend the presuppositions that the school puts around them. And, and in this sort of practice of mentoring, the mentor offers support and advice and they hope that the relationship that begins as asymmetrical will gradually become more symmetrical so that the mentee will feel more of a member of the profession. And these policies are mandating uh, this kind of activity going on uh, and that the school will supply experienced mentors to support these new teachers. So there are sayings, doings and writings and some of the examples of social political arrangements. So why are they doing it? The project of mentoring, assisting the mentee to adjust into the professional role and practice. And they do that in practice landscapes that alongside teaching, preparing lessons, attending staff meeting, all sorts of other things that go on. And they're trying to develop the disposition of the new teacher and help that teacher to use their situated knowledge about not only how to participate in mentoring, but how to participate in professional practice as a teacher. And it follows practice traditions, ancient ones in this case, uh, about the practice tradition of mentoring as support, adult education pedagogies and practice traditions of workplace learning. These are just examples. These cells, when we were compiling them, 
these tables when we we're compiling them to write the article were gigantic. And so this is just summarizing a few things out of it. So here we are. I've tried to use this table of invention to show it can help us uh, to describe practice, uh, what people are saying and doing, how they're relating, analyze practices, what conditions help and hinder them, to critique practices, what are their untoward consequences, where do they lead us astray where we didn't think we were going astray, and how do they help us to identify conditions that could be changed to allow us to transform our practices. So that table of invention has become very prominent. Indeed, in the book that we wrote uh, and published in 2014, Changing Practices, Changing Education, all the substantive research empirical chapters use this to identify um, sayings, doings and relatings and the, and the arrangements that held them in place. Uh, in things we'll talk about uh, in a future episode. That's great, Stephen. Um, I have one just final question there for you, just looking at point four on your table of invention. Um, and you're talking, as you have been talking about in this episode, about transforming practice. I'm wondering, is it enough maybe in some situations for people to just gain insight into their practice or develop a new understanding of it um, without necessarily having to transform it? Well, that's an incredibly interesting question. <laughs> I think so. Uh, I think yes. Uh, yes, just gaining more insight. I remember the story of the, uh, of the Zen master who had a, a small hillock in front of him. And he used to walk up and down the hillock hundreds of times a day so he could become fully conscious of what he was doing and so he devoted his whole life or most days to becoming fully conscious of walking up and down this hillock well most of us try to do more complicated things in our days than that yeah. and the, and so i think getting more insight into what you're doing is really, really important. But as you get more insight, it also suggests there are ways that you can think differently about it and ways that you might be able to extend it or change it or whatever. But the other point to make is the one that the uh, Russian background American developmental psychologist Anna Stetsenko makes. And that is every time you act in the world, you are changing yourself and the world. Transformation isn't something unusual. Transformation is something every day. And so when you've got that inside out of your thinking about what you're doing, are you ever doing what you were doing before you had the inside? <laughs> because you can't really know whether it, it is exactly the same or, or not. I mean, maybe with some routines, cutting the bread and making the toast, um, it stays pretty standard. But uh, with teaching, you know, fifth grade, you know, nature study or something, it's, um, I don't think things stay quite so unchanged when you think about them. So I think that we're I think that we are a bit frightened by the word transformation when transformation is kind of more ordinary than we think. One of the things that's not so um, ordinary, however, is often when people want to make change, other people get horrified, and sometimes there are conflicts over making the change. Other people think things should should change differently. So making a change in a human social situation often involves coming up against the views and, and, and practices of others. And it can it can be 
a source of conflict, contestation, contradiction, and so on. It's not just um, always a, a smooth and beautiful thing. That's great, Stephen. Okay, well, thank you, Stephen, for helping us to understand how we might use the theory of practice architectures to understand practices in order to transform them. This was episode five of Researching Practice, introducing the Theory of Practice Architectures vodcast with Stephen Chemis and me, Maureen Glenn. The next episode is episode six, and it's entitled Practices Are Distributed. Thank you for watching episode five. You may access these vodcasts via YouTube on the link below or at stephenchemist.com or at eaori.ie. Looking forward to seeing you the next time. Goodbye. Bye.